we're talking about when he says yes because you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. How is my mind renewed? All I do is sit and listen. Sit and listen. The same thing that I would do in the world, now I do in the Word. You would say, well, reading the Bible is acting. Actually, I don't think it is. When I sit down in the morning and I have a cup of coffee and I drink and I drink my Bible and I read my Bible, when I do that in the morning, there's not a lot of activity going on there. There's zero work. I'm just reading the scripture. And when you do it, it transforms you. It does the work. The whole point of Christian life is that God is the one working, not you. Uh, how about this? Paul said, um, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For, um, for it is God who works in you. God works in you. God is working in us. The conclusion of this is now look. Uh, okay, Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's the result. So here, here we have the, the, the result when it says that, that word that, it's called a purpose clause or a purpose junction or conjunction. It's the whole result of, of being transformed. When I am transformed, the result of that is I can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's the key. That's the key to human life. That is the key to everything that we do. Can you say, I am doing God's will? I am doing God's will? If you and I can say that today, we are like living at the pinnacle of human experience. We are living a spiritual life. I am doing God's will. But you know why you can't say it? Because you're being conformed. Because the world is saying what you should be doing. The world is saying what you should be spending your time doing, what you should be listening to, what you should be reading, who you should be with, what you should be talking about. The world is giving you the script, and so you follow the script, you say, I'm lost. I don't know what I should be doing. What should I be doing with my life? God, I just, I just don't know. None of this is working for me. And God would say, no, no. It's transformation. It's who you are. Bring me who you are in Christ. Bring me the finished work. Bring me your glorified person. Bring me what I have done for you. And we can have a fellowship around that. We will learn this together. And in that, you will find out what is the good and perfect and acceptable, per good, acceptable and perfect will of God. And he actually goes on in Romans 12 to tell us what that good and perfect and acceptable will is. You want to do it? Yeah. Okay. What is the good and perfect, good, acceptable and perfect will of God? What is it for me? Because if I find it, oh, oh, if I find it, it will, it will give me, it will just complete my life. The good, acceptable, perfect. That's what I need. Good, acceptable, perfect. Good that it is effective. I mean, it has it's good in God's eternal value system. Acceptable in that it is what God uh, approves of, and complete means that it is it is um, perfect means it is complete. It is full. It's all that I need is to have that have that good, acceptable, perfect will. Then he says, verse two: For I say through the grace given to me. What grace was given to Paul? What grace was given to Paul? What grace was given to Paul was that Paul was a sinner, but he was saved, right? He was, he had, he was a blasphemer. He was, he killed Christians. He was a wicked sinner, and God saved him by the grace given to him. His salvation, his message, his revelation, everything. He attributes everything he was that God gave it to him. He didn't earn, he earn any of it. It was just given to him. I say that through the grace of God that every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly 
than you ought to think. And it's a play on words, and it says that you should not think, you should not overthink your thinking. Don't think of yourself higher than you should think of yourself. Don't overthink of yourself. Don't think of yourself too much. Like if you think, I'm the important person here, you are thinking of yourself too much. Because obviously, Christ is the important person. Christ is the, is the preeminent one. Don't think of yourself higher than you ought to. We know people who do. Like if you think about, uh, we're thinking about um, quarterbacks these days, you know, because that seems to be on the top of everyone's list. The most popular sports figure in, in America today. Uh, well, actually, yesterday it was Tim Tebow. I don't know where he is today. But, uh, yesterday, 3.1% of everybody's vote went to Tim Tebow. The next one down was 2.8. I think that was uh, that was a um, basketball player, Kobe Bryant, and then Tiger Woods, and then what was his name? Uh, Rogers. What's his name? Football. Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. He's so famous that he gets to be on Chevrolet commercials. And anyway, uh, everybody's thinking about football players, but actually, when you think about how is it possible that you are who you are, and really, I am who I am only because of what I have received. I am not responsible for my genetics. On all the formative years of my life, my parents paid for everything. They drove me, they sent me, they paid. Any person who is a professional today, by the time they were self-determining, they, um, they were already that person. 13, 14 years old, they, they were already like amazing football players or amazing tennis players, and none of it was because of themselves, except they were just doing what they were told. But they never would have any of them been where they are. For any of them to think in any way that they are better or they are somehow really good. Yeah, you can compare yourself, but how did you get there? You only got there because of grace. You only got there because of grace. Don't think of yourself higher than you ought to think, but think soberly according to God has dealt every man a measure of faith. Uh, this is interesting. It says, but think soberly. Uh, someone who thinks, can, thinks high of themselves he says the opposite of sober is insane, like to be insane. To think in a conceited way is to really be insane. Do you believe that you are somehow strong? Do you believe that what you have has not been given to you? Do, do you somehow believe that you have gotten yourself to where you are? Uh, that, is, that is absolute insanity, is what Paul is saying. But everyone, rather, has been given a measure of faith. Okay, everyone in this room, we have been given a measure of faith. Every one of us. That faith is designed by God to save us. Once we are saved, once we are saved, look at verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Many members, one body. You, we all are one body. One body. So unity is something that God gives if you, if you say, well, God, what is your will? He says, my will is unity. You want to know my will? My good, acceptable, perfect will. My will is unity. My will is that you don't think highly of yourself because it is divisive. It doesn't produce unity. Right? Competition, comparison, um, those things produce division, not unity. I want unity. But Lord, how can we be one when we are so weird? We are so different from each other. Men and women, that's as far as the East is from the West, those two genders. Guys, maybe you haven't figured that out yet. If you read this book called Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, and you can begin to understand the differences between men and women. It is like night and day. We are very, very different. And that's not a generalization. That is, that is an absolute truth. Our brains are wired differently. Women have more wiring in their head than we do. Don't get me wrong, they're just sinners too. But women have different wiring. They, their connections between their two lobes are 
I don't know how many there are, but men are not connected in the main part of the brain, and women are. Women pull from information from their entire brain, and men don't. Men live in compartments. Women live uh, like conscious of many things. I, it's because of design. Anyway, men and women are very different. Lord, how can there be unity? And he says, don't look down to figure out how all these different people can be the same, can be one, not the same, but one. Instead, look up and you will see the body of Christ. And when you see that you are in the body, then you will say, oh, look, there's the finger and there's the toe. And there's the tongue and there's the ear. Now I realize where there's unity. There's unity because of what we are part of, not because of what we are like. If we look at Christ, we see unity. The Lord says, here's my will. You wouldn't even, you can't even know it. You know how many people are looking at Christianity and they say, there's the Baptists, there's the Methodists, there's the Presbyterians, there's the Catholics. There. All these people so divided, see, Christians are all, are all divided up, there's no unity. But unity is not because we're all acting alike or we all... We all say the same thing or whatever. Unity happens because of a spiritual reality that's in us. That when I got saved, I became a part of something that is real. It's called the body of Christ. That's what has been given to us. And we are part of a body. And this is where I want to go. We're going to talk about it again next week. But this is the conclusion. When you and I get saved, one, we, we get spiritual life, right? Hey, young. Thankfully, some people don't snore when they sleep. <laughs> He's completely out, out. Anyway, so when we get saved, like drool all down the front of the sheet. No, when we get saved, when we get saved, we we are received Zoe life, right? We receive eternal life in our hearts. And God puts us in the body. But also, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says that when you got saved, you were given gifts. Spiritual gifts, not talent. Like John plays guitar. Frank, 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 Frank. You know, he plays guitar. Uh, Pastor Joy, he bangs on the drums. He has rhythm. He was born with rhythm. God didn't give it to him when he got saved. John was born with the ability to play guitar. Now, he trained the ability, and now it's a skill. But he was born with it. People that are born to sing, I don't know if you ever noticed it, some people can sing, and some people really can't. I mean, they can't. They shouldn't be, at least not in public. They just shouldn't. They just can't keep a tune. They're tone deaf. If you say, sing this, uh, and they go, uh, and they think they're singing. Okay? It's because they don't have that talent. And you know, when someone gets saved, it's not like all of a sudden, la, 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 la. like, oh my gosh, he's been given the gift of singing. Because there is no gift of singing. There's no gift of music. He was like, I'm going to use my gift for the Lord. Well, your gift is not music because there is no gift of music. It's not a spiritual gift. The devil can play music. The unsaved person can play music and praise the Lord. Saved people can play it too, but they'd rather have saved people play in worship. And unsaved people. One time we were at, at our church in Budapest, and the person said, you know, that piano player can only play like really simple chords. I think that she should be playing, because she's got a master's degree in piano. And I said, oh, really? That's amazing. I said, do you think the best piano player should be playing? And she said, well, yes, I do. I said, well, do you think that the devil can play piano better than her? Probably you can. Do you think you should be playing together? <laughs> it's not talent. It's not talent. I'd rather have someone who can minister to people than someone who plays excellent. And you know what that spirit is? It's like, listen to this. Play all these funky chords. It's like, see? You gotta be smart. You gotta be trained to play chords like that. Not just any idiot can play like that. It's like, really, you wanna play in the church? That is like the most divisive. Uh, carnal, sinful, even demonic spirit. You will divide our church. Oh, there's the people who understand really good music, and here's the morons over here that can only, you know, either are tongue deaf or can only play three majors in a minor, and they call them 
couples of musicians that said we. Uh, God has given each one of us gifts. What are your gifts? That's the question. If you are saved, it says the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit came into us, He gave us gifts. I believe there are 19 of them. Uh, we will we'll, um, study a little bit next week just to see. Because I would, I would think that we would want to know, Lord, what are my gifts? Because they are given to me not to, for me to earn money. They're not like a, like a, it's not like the Lord gives me a vocational skill when I get saved. Like, well, you don't have to go to college because when you get saved, I'm going to make you a dentist. Or I'm going to just give you car mechanics. So you, it's not to make money, because our skills can do that, of course. But it has to do with the body of Christ. The scripture says that the, the gifts are given to us to edify and to build the body. So we call it body building. How does God build the church? He does it with gifts. He does it with gifts. Who has them? Everybody. How many? I don't know. That's my really daughter would say. I don't know. I don't know how many, but I know at least one. Every person has at least one gift. And I know that some have more. Why did God give it to you? He gave it to you to build the body. He gave it to you for body life, what's called body life. Life in the church. That's why we were given our gifts. And until we operate in our gifts, we're always going to be unsatisfied. Because he gave us gifts so that they would empower our lives and give us a ministry and give us really something that he is doing in the body of Christ. That's why he's given them to us, for everyone's sake. Uh, you can read 1 Corinthians 12 for homework if you want to read it this week. Even though I know UJ has more reading to do than that because he's on the calendar. So maybe you don't get to 1 Corinthians 12. But for those who are not doing the reading, that the church is all doing here, that the adults are doing read through the Bible in a year. Uh, after you get done with your three chapters, if you're up to date, you don't have six or nine or however many, there's not one you have in jail. You know, probably. I mean, you just skip a day and it's a lot. You skip two days and it's like the mountain, the mountain is growing. I'm going to be here for a week just reading to catch up. But if you read 1 Corinthians 12, you'll see there the biggest list of the gifts is also Romans 12. These two chapters, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, those are gift chapters. Everyone has a gift. You should know what your gift is. Read the list of gifts. We'll talk about them. We're going to talk about them next week so that you, are, you, you and I can operate in our gifts. Our gifts are things given to us for others' sake. John has gifts for our sake. I have gifts for your sake. You have a gift for our sake. See, that's the body of Christ. That's how it works. And, uh, and maybe, maybe you know what your gift is. You can go online and search. There's all kinds of these things to figure out what your gift is. You can, if you want to know, if you want your gift to be a certain thing, you know how to answer the questions. But if you answer them honestly, there's one that's got 140 questions. Uh, you know, you can find out what your gift is. I really, I really think that God will reveal it to you. Maybe you don't know it yet. Maybe as you read the gifts and you read what they are, um, that you uh, you begin to wonder, Lord, is that is that my gift? 